So good afternoon, and I'd like to begin by thanking uh, you all for coming today and welcoming you to this year's annual Carson Lecture. My name is Kara Ritzheimer, and I'm an associate professor in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, and it's my honor today to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lori Marhofer. The Carson Lecture is a speaker uh, series dedicated to the memory of George and Dorothy Carson. George was once the chair of the history department, and he taught Russian history for several years, um, and Dorothy was his wife. And the Carson Lecture Series was first established in 1981 to bring scholars studying Russian history to OSU. And then the department modified that a little bit, as far as I understand, and brought in the series to bring um, senior scholars in the field of European history. And in the last few years, we've modified the series again, and more and more, we're inviting younger scholars who are doing pioneering work. Sometimes being a pioneer means shining a light on neglected topics. Sometimes it means re-examining key questions through a new lens. And sometimes it means challenging long-held assumptions about historical moments. So when I was asked in August of last year to organize this year's lecture, I immediately knew the pioneering scholar I wanted to invite to campus was Dr. Lori Marhofer. Dr. Marhofer received her PhD from Rutgers in 2008 and is an associate professor at the University of Washington. She is a historian of Weimar and Nazi Germany, German-speaking Europe, and queer and, a queer and trans politics, and the author of several publications that each in their own way are pioneering new ways to think about these historical eras. Her 2015 book, The Sex and the Weimar Republic, German Homosexual Emancipation and the Rise of the Nazis, studies the gay and trans rights movements of the 1920s, but it goes further and offers a compelling analysis as it explores how certain groups, including gay men and lesbian women, acquired greater freedom while other groups suffered continued, continued oppression. The book also takes on what she calls the Nazi backlash thesis, which suggests that the price paid for sexual freedom was conservatives turning their support to the Nazis. The book has been well reviewed, with one scholar, Jeffrey Giles, calling it the best book to date in either English or German, which was something I would like to have said about me, um, on the history of homosexuality in Weimar. Her 2016 article, Lesbianism, Transvestitism, and the Nazi State, a micro-history of a Gestapo investigation, published in the American Historical Review, is similarly innovative. Dr. Marhofer uses the Gestapo case file of a non-gender conforming individual who came to the attention of the Gestapo through a denunciation to weigh in on the question of Nazi persecution of lesbians and to suggest we pay attention to the category of risk as we look at this issue. Her curiosity and energy seems boundless. At the moment, she's working on three books, which is impressive. She's also brought her expertise to bear on more contemporary issues. She has published articles in the Washington Post, uh, in Slate, Salon, and Newsweek.com. And before arriving at the University of Washington, um, well, she's held several positions, most recently at Syracuse University. We're delighted she's here with us today. Please help me in welcoming Lori Marker. Um, thank you so much, Kara. Thank you. That was a really generous introduction. Thank you. Um, just going to timing myself. OK. Um, uh, so thank you so much for having me here, and thank you for coming to this talk. Thanks to Kara Ritzheimer and Natalia Bueno for organizing and bringing me. Um, uh, it's an honor to speak in this series. Okay, um, so I'm going to start uh, by talking about an email that I received about a year ago. Uh, I like to start with. I usually like to start with some kind of a action sequence, but this is an email, but it was not any ordinary email. Okay. Um, so I was in my kitchen about a year ago, and I got an email from a woman who works as a lawyer for the federal government in Washington, D.C. And she was writing to me about uh, this event that the U.S. federal government puts on every year. It's called Holocaust Days of Remembrance. I didn't know about this until she wrote to me, but it was established in 1979 by Congress, and it's an annual commemoration specifically of the victims of the Holocaust that takes place in the Capitol. So, uh, it's a commemoration of the victims of the Holocaust, and there's an associated list of who those victims are that goes along with the event. As you, as you probably know, over the past 20 years, it's become standard to recognize, of course, Jewish victims, um, but then also people in other groups. And often the way that these groups are recognized is through a list, um, which I'll talk more about at the end of the talk. But, uh, so the list includes um, Jews, Roma, uh, communist dissenters, people with disabilities who were killed in the T4 program, 
uh, Polish people, there, there are a variety of versions of the list, and usually now gay men are in that list as well. In the Obama administration, transgender people were in the list too for this official event. When Trump became president, they were no longer included in that list. And the, the lawyer wrote to me because of that. She was concerned that transgender people were no longer in the list for the official commemorative event. And she wanted to have a dialogue with the people at the Holocaust Museum about that. Okay, so the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington is the United States' official memorial to the Holocaust. Has, any, has anyone here been to the museum? I'm curious. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so pretty. So a very like well-visited museum. Um, uh, and they, uh, w with the establishment of the Holocaust Museum, they, they got very involved in the Holocaust Remembrance Days event. So the lawyer who wrote to me asked me if I would agree to be on an email chain with one of the curatorial uh, staff. It, it turned out to be one of the head curators of the museum to email about this question of why transgender people were not included. And I said, yes, of course. Um, so she started the ball rolling. She, she wrote me and the curator and one of my colleagues, Katie Sutton, and, and, and said, why, why has this happened? Why were transgender people taken off the list of victims? Transgender people were... Um, indeed victimized by the Nazis. And the curator wrote back, and he said, um, transgender people are not included in the list of victims of the Holocaust for the purposes of this event because, number one, there were no transgender people in Nazi Germany. Uh, the word transgender, and you're right to like be tittering because that's <laughs> not accurate. Um, the word transgender was not invented until the 1980s, which is true. Um, but he said, and, and, there, and then he, I think he said something like, you know, there were people who might have had a proto-identity, but they were understood to be homosexual, and the state understood them to be homosexual. Therefore, they are included under the, the category homosexual in this list, and they weren't persecuted separately from that. So there was no persecution of transgender people separate from the persecution of gay men is what he was contending. Okay, so the, the lawyer, um, to her credit, wrote back and said, well, what about the Institute for Sexual Science? What about this flourishing transgender culture? And the curator wrote back and said, literally, I'm not making this up. <laughs> he said, um, I'm gonna retire in two months. You know what, I'm kinda done. Like, this is <laughs> and, and that was the end. Um, and they didn't change the list of people. Okay, so this talk is about this question. Um, um, the whole email exchange really got me thinking about should transgender people be on the list of Holocaust victims? They often are not, though again, they were under the Obama administration for the purposes of this fed federal commemoration. Um, and I, you know, the, this is another question. The, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum's website is, is, I would say, the major English language resource for the general public on the Holocaust. It's the best online resource there is. It's the most comprehensive. It's used by people all the, constantly. Um, and there's no entry for transgender, and there's no entry for transvestites either, which is the identity category that I'll talk about that was used at the time. Um, okay, why is that? All right, so a little bit of background. Um, the Nazis took power in Germany in 1933. Between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Nazi dictatorship, so the period of the 1920s, i uh, post a little bit on both sides, Germany had a progressive democratic government called the Weimar Republic. Um, and Germany in that period of the 20s was probably the, the best place on earth uh, for queer, well, it was the most tolerant place that we know of um, when it comes to queer or gay and lesbian as well as transgender subcultures um, that took this modern form around identity categories similar to what, um, what we find in the early 21st century. So there was a large, visible subculture of queer people and also of transgender people. And those two groups of people overlapped and were the same people sometimes, um, and at other times were not. Um, there was rather widespread public re recognition of transvestites, and there was a specific law against cross-dressing. So you've probably heard of paragraph 175, Right, the sodomy law. Um, this is the law that the Nazis used to persecute gay men. It was illegal for adult men to have consensual sex 
in Nazi Germany. The law dates back um, to the Middle Ages, um, and it was on the books in both Germanys after the Nazi period. And there were similar laws in other countries, including the United States. Uh, so paragraph 175 is remembered today, but paragraph 183, I bet Professor Ritzheimer is the only person who remembers that. So that was a law against gross indecency, and it was used not only against people who were perceived by the police to be cross-dressed, um, so they also used it against people who were perceived to be disorderly or um, uh, engaged in sexually um, unregulated conduct, but it was also it was used to police cross quote unquote cross dressing. There were similar laws in other countries, including the U.S. There's a great book that just came out in California's um, anti cross dressing statute. Um, okay, so paragraph 183 not not as well remembered as paragraph 175, um, and I'm going to talk more about it in the Nazi era. Um, okay. So for all of these reasons, I, I've, I think that the curator at the museum um, was totally off base on that one. Um, let me talk a little bit now about the pre-1933 subculture, and then I'll talk about the Nazi period and the persecutions, and I'm going to talk through uh, the case of one person from Hamburg um, who was uh, convicted under paragraph 183 as well as paragraph 175. Okay. Um, so first, I'm going to define this term transvestite. Oh, here's a slide. Okay, I want to be really careful with this because the term transvestite today means something different than what it meant in Germany in the early and mid 20th century, and it's offensive today to a lot of people, particularly the people who identify as transgender. It's offensive. There, so there are still some people who self-identify as transvestites, um, but it's offensive to a lot of other people, so I want to be really careful with it. I'm going to use it, but I'm using it in its historical sense. Um, okay, uh, and I also want to um, uh, take care with this current term cross-dressing. So cross-dressing is uh, not an accurate description of, um, uh, or cross-dressing is a term and a concept that was used by the state and by people hostile to people with transgender identities. Um, so as Susan Stryker writes, to paraphrase her, um, a transgender person dressed in the clothing of their, their actual sex is not a cross-dressed person, that's just a dressed person, right? Um, uh, okay, um, so transvestite, a term of positive self-identification, it was at the time, so it's coined in uh, 1910, and it was an umbrella term that encompassed a number of different things. Um, kind of similar, not, not identical to transgender by any means, but not that different from uh, the, this expansive definition of transgender that Susan Stryker uses. So this is not the only definition of transgender. I'm not trying to say it's necessarily the one that we should all use or not. Um, but what I'm trying to say is this, is this is an umbrella term, so you can see that it covers enough people who are having different experiences around gender. Um, so people who move away from their birth assigned gender because they feel strongly that they properly belong to another gender through which it would be better for them to live. Um, and it also covers people who feel the need to challenge the conventional expectations bound up with the gender that was initially put upon them. Okay, so there's a variety of different experiences and practices here that are not necessarily totally distinct. Similarly, transvestite um, in the 20s. So there are people who use this term to self-identify who uh, live most of the time as their, the sex that they were assigned at birth and who occasionally in private dress in the clothing of what to them is the other sex and who uh, sometimes for erotic reasons. Um, but there are also people who use the term transvestite uh, such as this author uh, who went by H.W. Berg who are um, people whose birth assigned sex is not their true authentic sex and who want to live their lives as their true authentic sex and are, and are doing that insofar as it's possible. Um, okay, um, so an umbrella term that had a very different meaning at the time. And if you look, if you look through these transvestites, so one example of the vibrant Weimar transgender culture are these magazines, like this one. And if you read through them, they would occasionally debate whether 
transvestite was an appropriate term. And some people were frustrated by it because they thought it was too focused on clothing and that it implied that transvestite identity was about clothing when actually it was a much deeper experience for them. It was about their soul. And at one point somebody suggested transsensible as an alternative. Yeah, my students really like that. So they were all like transsensible. They were afraid of that. But um, it didn't catch on. <laughs> Transvestite persisted. After the Second World War, some people started to use transsexual as a positive term of self-identification, and eventually, probably a lot of people would have adopted transgender. Um, okay, so um, uh, here we go. So the, this is an like a incredible, beautiful just like Bundesarchiv photograph of transvestites in front of the Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin. Um, I don't know anything about these people. The cap all we have is the photographer's name and his caption, and the caption is transvestites in front of the Institute for Sexual Science. And then in this photograph on the right, you see Magnus Hirschfeld, um, the founder of the Institute for Sexual Science, the person who coined the term transvestite in 1910. He was not himself a transvestite, contrary to what um, some people have written, but uh, he was quietly homosexual and he was a big supporter of transvestite activism. So as early as the 19th century in Germany, Hirschfeld and other supportive doctors were helping transgender people to get police permission to live as their um, self-confirmed sex. And these police permissions were called transvestite passports. And, and it was a piece of paper um, that said, so-and-so is a transvestite and they are allowed to dress in, they are allowed to quote unquote cross-dress. So again, to the person in question that was not cross-dressing, but to the police it was. Um, uh, he also helped people to secure name changes, which were very important, Employ even more so then than now, employment was really gender specific. So having a first name that didn't fit your sex um, could be a big problem in getting a job, um, and it could be important to change your name. That became, and name changes became even more possible after the First World War. Germany liberalized the regulations about changing names, and a lot of Jews actually changed their name in that period as well, to sound more German. Um, okay, and finally, early um, sex confirming surgeries. Um, or sex change surgeries, as they were called at the time, seemed to date to around 1900. Um, got much better when plastic surgery improved during the First World War. Um, not many people are interested in undertaking this, or do undertake it, but it was possible. Um, and some people did, and there's the famous case of Lily Elba. Uh, recently, the topic of a movie, the Danish, a really bad movie. <laughs> um, uh, who was a, a person who, um, she underwent sex confirming surgery and then wrote a very popular memoir about it in the 20s. Um, okay. Uh, clubs. So transvestite subcultures were centered around magazines and they were centered around places of public accommodation like the El Dorado. Um, the El Dorado was Berlin's most famous queer club, and it was also famous for its transvestite uh, wait staff. And some of the people who worked at the El Dorado were transvestites. There's a, there's a really interesting file at the Landis Archiv of a, a person who, is, um, who self identifies as a woman and is identified by the police as a man who worked at the El Dorado and who was a transvestite. Um, uh, so this wasn't just, this was partially for tourists and for show, but it was also a place of employment um, and a place of public culture. Knowledge of transvestites in pre-Nazi Germany seems to have been relatively widespread. So there are sexological studies of transvestites that are published, but there's also a, a bit of outreach to the general public. Um, the Alderado was really famous. And here's another example. In 1922, the Berlin police called a press conference to announce to the public um, that the widespread idea that men who wear women, I'm quoting here from this, uh, this is a newspaper report. Um, okay, so the press conference was to tell the public that the following 
was an incorrect idea. Okay, and the incorrect idea was, quote, the widespread idea that men who wear women's clothing or women who wear men's clothing are disguised criminals, pickpockets, spies, or people who traffic in, or, or pro people involved in the prostitution trade. Um, and then the newspaper goes on to report that the police told the public that in fact cross-dressed people are transvestites and that this is their, their natural disposition is to dress in this clothing in this way. Okay, um, so one thing this shows you is that the public was aware enough of transvestites that they were worried about them and confused about them, that the Berlin police were informed enough about modern left of center sexology that they understood the category transvestite enough to explain it to the public. And it also shows you this, this thing that, I, that is really particular to trans history that is not as present in queer history that I want to point out, which is the fear that people had about people they thought were cross-dressed. Okay? Um, so uh, the phenomenon of passing is really important in trans history, are you passing, are you not passing, when are you passing and not passing. In moments where a person is, is passing and then the person is not passing, the people around that person notice, like, oh, that's a cross, again, not cross-dressed by self-affirmation, but to an outsider, a cross-dressed person. And then what does that mean to the outsider? Well, in this case, it means they might be a disguised criminal or a spy. And indeed, there's a long history in Europe of people cross-dressing in order to commit crime or even espionage. And I think um, one of the reasons that we, uh, you know, this was kind of incredible when I noticed it, and one of the reasons that I think we've lost the memory of this is that we forget how gender-specific clothing was. It was so gender-specific that and my sense is that people read gender off of clothing much more readily than we do. We're used to looking for other markers of gender because clothing is not as clearly gendered anymore. I mean, I, I, I would be, just by the virtue of the pants, I would be cross-dressed in the 20s. Um, uh, so it was easier to fool people by wearing the clothing of the other um, sex. And there are cases of people who, who committed burglary or who were uh, spying during the war and were cross-dressed to do that. Um, okay, uh, so there's this association between quote-unquote cross-dressing and espionage or deceit or fraud um, that I want to draw your attention to. Um, but let me move on here to talk about what happened in 1933. Um, oh, here's another slide of, this is the, this is, so this picture is all over the place on the internet and I haven't been able to source it, this photograph of the people at the bar, but that's supposedly that's inside the Eldorado. Um, okay. All right, so after the Nazis took power, they made a very public display of shutting down these gay, lesbian, and transvestite subcultures. This photograph was staged um, on purpose to kind of show how the regime's like cleaning up the streets. Um, however, these subcultures persisted quietly. Um, they went underground, but people still met. Um, there were still gay bars. There was a gay bar in Hamburg, the Schlack Casino, that wasn't advertised as a gay bar, but was known as one through word of mouth. Um, the, the police, uh, you see enough, they'll always be like, they met at the notorious Schlack Casino, a, a hotbed of homosexuality. And it's like two years later, the police are like, and the notorious Schlack Casino, a hotbed of homosexuality. <laughs> Why aren't you shutting the Schlack Casino? <laughs> so, if it's a hotbed, but indeed they did not. Um, uh, and another example of this that I found is a, a woman by the name of Helena Knabe, who had a very public business in Weimar in the transvestite magazines as a kind of transvestite life coach, especially for transgender women. So she, if you were a transgender woman, you could contact her. She would help you figure out how to buy clothing. The sizing of clothing was a big difficulty. Um, she, at one point, she was manufacturing Braziers in sizes that would work for more transgender women. Um, and she's very present in the transvestite magazines in Weimar. So in 1930, for example, she organized a transvestite fashion show that was attended by over 300 people. And there's a report of this in one of the magazines. Um, uh, I was really surprised to encounter Helena Knabe again in the archive of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in a police file from 1937, she had kept her business alive. 
she was no longer advertising in, uh, although, no, actually, she, she, they caught her because she put an ad in a paper for a quote unquote brassiere for men, which really meant a brassiere in a size that would work for a transgender woman, but she was advertising it as a brassiere for men because transgender women would know what that meant. Um, and then they investigated and they found that she had a newsletter that she had been sending out by mail to her clients for years, that she kept the circle of clients together. Um, and she was prosecuted under the under paragraph 184 of the obscenity law. Um, but okay, so so on the one hand, they're shutting things down. On the other hand, people are finding ways to keep, to keep things going. And the, and the Nazi state is not always as concerned about homosexuality um, or transvestitism as I think we would expect, as the example of the Stadt Casino demonstrates to you. Um, okay, so what was it like to be a transvestite in Nazi Germany? Let me give you... Um, a couple of stories about this. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the case of a woman named Heinrich Böde. I, uh, I don't have anything that Böde wrote about herself that was not mitigated through the Hamburg police and court system, so I don't know I, I don't feel like I can say with absolute certainty how this person identified, but there's a lot of evidence that she identified as a woman, um, so I'm going to use female pronouns to refer to her. I, I, I know for a fact that she had a woman's name that she used, and I don't know what it was. So um, her, first, her, her first name in the case is Heinrich. Um, okay, so here's the story um, about this person. Late one Saturday night in November of 1939, Buda went with her aunt, Margareta, to a bar. Um, the two of them were in a good mood, the aunt reported later. They had already drunk a bottle of wine, probably at home in the one-room apartment that they shared. So uh, she lived with her aunt. Their background was working class. The aunt worked in a factory, um, and Buda, uh, who had only done a few years of elementary level education, was working at the time in a carpenter's shop. When they went out that night to the bar, Buddha was dressed as a woman. She had a lady's handbag, she had sculpted eyebrows, she had on makeup. Um, she would later tell police that she often went out in public dressed as a woman and that she was a transvestite. Um, okay, so at the bar, uh, Buddha was in her late 20s, by the way, she caught the eye of three soldiers, or the eyes of three soldiers. The soldiers had recently come back from the war in Poland, which had only been going on for a few months, and it was going well for Germany at that point. Buda bought the soldiers a round of beers, and they came over and joined her and her aunt at their table. Talk got around to the war in Poland. Buda asked the soldiers some questions about what was going on in Poland, how the campaign was going. And at that point in the conversation, when she, when she started to ask about the war, or so the soldiers later told the police, they started to suspect that she was not what she seemed, or so they said. Um, so later that night, one of the soldiers made the following statement to the police. She tried to ask us about the campaign in Poland. We did not answer, and we concluded simultaneously that this was a man in women's clothing. Um, at Buddha's subsequent trial, the soldier said that um, they felt like she was really asking a lot of questions about Poland, and they started to get suspicious. So it was this interest in the Polish campaign that sparks a moment where the soldiers, from their perspective, recognize that this person is cross-dressed, that this person is not who they seem to be. Again, this is not Buddha's self-conception or version of the story. She's, to her, she's not cross-dressed. Um, okay, so something happened in the conversation and Buddha sensed that the mood had changed and that there was danger and she made an excuse and got up saying that she was going to uh, use the bathroom. She tried to leave but the soldiers grabbed her and they hauled her off to a police officer who was walking a beat in the fish market and that, person, that guy arrested her. Um, okay, so why? Why were they upset? Well, they seemed to have thought she was a spy. And this wasn't an uncommon, uncommon assumption to make, as I, as I argued earlier. There was a widespread perception that people who were quote-unquote cross-dressed were in disguise for nefarious purposes, espionage, or crime. I found this in other cases. 
Um, there's nothing explicit in the file about espionage, but the initial police report on the incident um, really foregrounds her questions about Poland. And, and I submit that this shows that it was at the, at the top of the sort of, or in the foreground for the police as well when they thought about what had happened. Um, and my assumption is that everybody was so clear on that that there was no need to write, you know, um, this person is probably a spy, but um, you can, you know, you can make your own decision. But here's the report. Uh, man in women's clothing asking questions about the campaign in Poland. Okay. Um, so an association between cross-dressing and espionage and, and potential danger to the state. Again, I think this is a lesser appreciated but really central feature of how 20th century societies reacted to people who had transgender identities. Um, this idea that cross-dressing was connected to espionage or fraud, and you, and you see it up through the 20th century. It put transgender people at risk. And, and this was a risk that gender conforming or cisgender queer people didn't face. This association between espionage um, or crime and, um, and cross-dressing. Um, it was strong enough that during the First World War, uh, Magnus Hirschfeld's organization uh, published an article in its journal that urged uh, transvestites to wear the clothing of the sex that was not their self-confirmed sex for the, safe of safe, the sake of safety, because so many people thought that cross-dressing was a sign of spying that they were worried about their safety. Um, okay. So a particular feature of transgender history that speaks to a particular kind of risk that's being run. Okay. Um, so as you can see, um, yeah, so as you can see from the slide, if you read German, um, uh, Buddha, the, the soldiers and also the police started to suspect that Buddha, in fact, was a gay man. Um, so it says in the slide, here's a warm brother, um, which is slang for a gay man. And police quickly moved away from the suspicion of espionage to this other suspicion. When they ran Buddha's name through their files, they found that she had a number of prior convictions. She had been convicted for cross-dressing under paragraph 183, and in other incidents, she had been convicted under paragraph 175 for having sex with men. Um, I just want to pause. So, so to Buddha, potentially, as a transgender woman, that was not homosexual sex, but to the police, it was. Um, sex between Buddha and a male-identified person. Okay. Um, so let me, let me pause here and make a point about agency um, before I come to the conclusion of this case. And that is that I think Buddha and her aunt went to that bar that night assuming that Buddha was going to pass. She was dressed up. She was wearing makeup. She had a lady's handbag. I think they assumed she was going to pass because not passing was risky, as you can see. It would be dangerous for Buddha to be identified as a quote-unquote man in women's clothing. So I think they thought she would pass. Um, I think Buddha probably passed a lot. Um, Buddha told the police that she often went out in women's clothing. Her aunt, who she lived with, who she was close with, was um, confident enough that she would pass. I mean, it was dangerous. You, know, you, would, you would expect that her aunt would try to dissuade her from doing that. Um, but she did not. It doesn't seem to have been an, an, uh, anything but an average night for them. Buddha um, got the attention of the soldiers. Um, I think she probably passed a lot of the time. Um, in their many reports on Buddha, this is a big file, the police noted several times that she had a feminine appearance. Um, so, quote unquote, they wrote at one point, Buddha's appearance as well as his, they are using male pronoun, his speech is conspicuously feminine. Um, so the passing is evidence of the persistence of some kind of queer and trans life, even under this repressive homophobic regime, a regime where, um, as you can see, the, the cross-dressing can be associated with um, you know, uh, violating the norms that, that um, are the foundation of the state. Um, Buddha had prior cross-dressing convictions. Um, one was for an incident where she and her aunt went to a bar and Buddha danced and invited some men to dance with her. Okay, so 
what's happening here is, is the agency of a transgender woman creating a transgender life for herself under a repressive state, and it's also a practice of risk running, I, I submit. So Boda perceives these risks and she's negotiating them. She's finding a way to live her life in the face of risk. She's making judgments about danger. Um, I, I don't, uh, uh, historians aren't supposed to second guess people in the past, um, but it, it, it seems like she uh, mis-evaluated the risk in this case. Um, so she was confident, and then uh, some, the, the line of questioning about Poland in particular suddenly disrupted her ability to pass in a way that she didn't anticipate. Um, okay, so she was charged under the cross-dressing law. She was tried. She was convicted. Um, while she was awaiting trial, prosecutors had a doctor examine Berta, which is not any, which is a bad yeah, bad. that is bad. Whenever a doctor is asked to examine a person who's been convicted, that is not good in the Nazi penal system. Um, the doctor found evidence that she was congenitively defective. That is, that she suffered from a mild men mental disability that impaired her judgments about sexual morality, and that she was at very high risk to reoffend following a jail sentence. Um, the doctor based this determination both on the prior convictions and about details from her childhood that they took from interviews with her and her relatives, which is, um, makes for heartbreaking reading, but they interviewed relatives about what kind of toddler she was, and apparently she liked to sing and dance, and this was supposedly evidence of an innate defective disposition. Um, they also conducted a physical exam that supposedly showed a feminine um, physical state. Um, the doctor administered a very flawed intelligence test and, and decided that Buddha was lacking in intelligence. Again, she was working class and had a limited formal education, and often these intelligence tests were written in a way that um, skewed towards people who had gone through gone further in the educational system. Um, so the doctor decided that she ought to be classified as degenerate. Um, in the words of the court that, that assessed this report by the doctor, Buddha was, quote, mentally limited, weak-willed, hysterical, flamboyant, a passive homosexual psychopath with a tendency to transvestitism. So psychopath in this context doesn't mean what it means to us. It meant a, it meant a very different form of mental disability, a mild mental disability that impaired um, judgments about morality. Um, the officials involved in this case recommended that something be done to Boda in addition to the, a prison sentence because she was so likely to re-offend. Um, and the court wrote that her only hope of reform was a very strict regime of discipline. She was transferred out of the regular penal system into the concentration camp system. She was sent to Buchenwald, which is near Weimar, and she was murdered there in 1943. Um, okay. So let me make a couple of points about this. Um, uh, the extreme violence at the end of this story is a result of this system that was parallel to but separate from the criminal justice system that had existed before 1933. So they do not completely remake the penal system. They retain courts, prosecutors, and police, although there are some changes that are made, and they retain the penal code, although again some laws are changed and some laws are added. Um, the concentration camp system is new, and it's parallel, and you could get um, plucked out of the regular court system and sent into the camp system, and that was a very, very negative outcome. Um, so there are 50,000 convictions for sodomy in Nazi Germany, and we think that about 5,000 of those people who were convicted for sodomy were murdered, and those murders happened in the camp system. So those are cases for the most part, although there are a couple of special court cases where there were death sentences. Um, but those people were taken out of the regular penal system because they were perceived to be at high risk of reoffending and sent into the camp system where they were killed. Um, okay, the single biggest factor um, that got Buddha sent to Buchenwald were her prior convictions. Contributing to that was the doctor's finding that, that she was in effect me both mentally disabled, queer, and transgender. So this is partially a case about disability, um, and this is a regime that murdered over 100,000 disabled people in the T4 program. Um, so it's a regime where 
uh, uh, being being seen as disabled can be very um, uh, really draws state violence to one. Um, she's ultimately defined not as a homosexual, not as a transvestite, but as a homosexual psychopath with transvestite tendencies. Okay, so it's this conglomerate idea. Um, her gender contributed to the doctor's finding, and and you can see this here. Um, and I very, I very rarely find ideological statements in these police and prosecutorial files, but this is one of them. So, so here she's really presented as somebody who's undermining the Mannerstadt, the, the state of manly outlook. Um, you see also this idea um, of, of counterfeit or fraud in this quote as well. So this contributes to the, to, um, the violence, uh, but it, this is not the whole story, right? Um, her bad luck to have prior convictions, the, the fact that she negotiated risk in a way that did not work out on several occasions, um, the finding that she had a feminine body, the finding that she was um, mentally disabled, um, all of this feeds together into the decision to take her out of the regular penal system where she probably would have served one or two years and instead to send her to the camp system. Okay. Um, the fact that she could not afford a lawyer was hugely significant. I, the, the defendants in the regular penal system could retain lawyers if they could afford it, and they tended to do better if they could do that. Okay. Um, here's another case, and I, I'm not going to say too much about this case, but this involves a person, again, this person even more so, I do not know how they self-identified. Um, they are a science female, um, but they are identified as having dressed often in men's clothing. Um, this person's name is Ilsa Tutska. So she was denounced repeatedly by her neighbors for lesbianism um, and also for gender nonconformity. Eventually, um, Tutska decided to try to leave Germany because she, was being she felt she was being hounded by the Gestapo. She tried to take a Jewish woman with her. She's one of the rare, quote unquote, Aryans who um, uh, went out of their way to try to save Jews who were um, scheduled for deportation. They were caught crossing the Swiss border. They were sent to concentration camps. Um, and they, incredibly, they both survived. Um, there's something that I noticed in this case, too, that was really odd. So the first denunciation, so you can see how she's dressed, right? Um, so Germany had had the new woman, right, and, and men's fashions had come in, but by the time this photo was taken, things had changed, men's fashions were no longer in for women, and the cut of this suit is, is, a, is a decidedly masculine cut in the boxiness of the shoulders. Um, the first denunciation of Tutska was not for helping Jews or having contact with Jews. The very first denunciation was from a person who thought she was a saboteur working for the French. And that person's report says that she hangs around military installations, she speaks, she did speak French, um, and he was worried about her. Um, why? Okay, so when the, the Gestapo got this denunciation, they went to her former landlord and asked that person about them, and he said, Oh no, I don't know her to be a saboteur, but she's a man-hater. She hates men, she's a lesbian, and she doesn't get along with people, and she hates the Nazis. Um, and so I, 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 I kind of, I started working on this file in graduate school, and I sat with it for years, and I could never figure out why the sabotage allegation, but I think you can probably see it now, right? Because there was this popular association between espionage, sabotage, and cross-dressing and she was considered to be cross-dressed. She doesn't seem to have passed um, as often or at all. I don't know if she was trying to pass. It's possible that she was a, perceived herself as a masculine woman. Um, uh, lots of people did, and some of those people used the term transvestite to self-identify. Um, okay, but so in the end, um, Totska wasn't condemned for cross-dressing. She wasn't condemned for lesbianism. She's condemned and sent to a camp to Robinsburg for helping a Jew, um, but the fact that her neighbors didn't like her gender performance or perceived sexuality drove her case forward. Um, so this is, oh, this is a, this is a, Lottie Ham, who is an important transvestite figure in Weimar, who also ends up in a concentration camp. Um, and the reason I have this here is so you can see the similarity of the way that they're dressed and the hairstyle. 
Um, oh, where's my letter? Oh no. Here it is, okay. Okay, so this is a denunciation letter denouncing Tatska for lesbianism. The, a lot of the allegations in this letter turned out not to be true, and the Gestapo wasn't that interested in, in, the, in lesbianism. It, lesbianism was not a crime in Germany, it was in Austria, um, and some other parts of the German Empire, but not in Germany proper. But the letter turned out to be important because it gave the Gestapo concrete evidence of her contact with Jews, and that they really did care about, particularly in 1941, um, as they were preparing to deport Jews from all over Germany, including Würzburg. And they did follow up on this. They followed up on the accusation that she was friendly with Jews. So my point about this is that even when the state wasn't interested in policing gender nonconformity or apparent homosexuality, the concern of people around a person put them at risk. Um, so again, this idea of risk being augmented by one's perceived gender performance or perceived sexuality. Okay. Um, okay. So let me conclude here. Were transgender people persecuted in Nazi Germany? Yes. And should they be in that list? Yes. Okay. Um, were they only persecuted insofar as the police thought that they were homosexual? No. Um, transgender history certainly is, is together with queer history and is, and is part of it, and yet at times it makes sense to analyze them separately. Okay. Um, moreover, the Nazi state reacts to people who are perceived, who are transgender, um, in a way that is distinct from how it reacts to people who are perceived to be homosexual but not transgender. People who are cisgender, gender conforming, and homosexual do not run the same kind of risk, although they are all running risks. Um, okay, but my hesitation um, here at the end is about this list. I don't think this list is the best way to describe the Nazi state. Um, or to describe the mass murders. And I wouldn't, I'm saying this to y'all because we're in an academic setting. I don't know that I would say this to the museum or at least not right now. Someday I'm gonna tell them all my ideas for the Holocaust Encyclopedia. Um, I mean, because part of what the, the lawyer who contacted me is trying to do is intervene in the present, right? The present is this moment when transgender people are really under attack by the right wing in this country and it's important. Um, uh, and that's important, that context is important. But this list, okay, let me read this to you. This is, their, this is the main page, so this is the first page. The Holocaust was the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi re regime and its collaborators. Um, and then it goes down, uh, it skip, uh, let me skip down to here. Okay, so during the era of the Holocaust, German authorities also targeted other groups because of their perceived racial inferiority, so Roma, um, the gypsies and some, I'm sorry, Roma, the disabled, and some of the Slavic peoples. Other groups were persecuted on political, ideological, and behavioral grounds, among them communists, socialists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and homosexuals. Okay, so there's a little bit more nuance here than just a simple list of victim groups. Um, but my, my point is, these groups are not at all persecuted in the same way. So people who are perceived as racial outsiders are identified, and let me just talk about the Reich, so just about Germany proper. Uh, German Jews, uh, German Roma are identified, rounded up, and deported to their deaths. Every, and the regime's goal is every last person, right? Um, what you see if you look at cases involving transgender people and queer people is a much more complicated process that plays out, for the most part, within the, the criminal justice system, within the penal system. Um, so I argue that um, rather than listing out, I mean, I, you know, what are we gonna do here? Um, some of these groups, so homosexuals, transgender people, are caught up in an effort to police them that's being carried out by police departments, courts, um, and uh, they are running risks. Those risks are particular in particular situations. Um, and the risks run by transgender people are distinct in some cases from those run by, um, are distinct from those run by cisgender queer people. Um, 
so I think that, um, let me see. When we think about risk, rather than thinking about gay men as a social group, I, I mean, I think they, they would be the behavioral group, they're a behavioral group according to this list. Um, and, and rather than adding transgender people on there, um, you know, I think that what we can do by talking about the running of risk and the agency of people um, and the ways in which the running of risk does not always go well and can result in extreme violence and did result in, the, in modern history's bloodiest persecution of gay men. Um, you know, one thing that it foregrounds is how important racism is in here, right? That the um, people who are identified as Aryan, who are homosexual or transgender, are in a completely different situation from people who are identified as Jewish or Roma in this system. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, this memorandum does not explicitly include, include gen transgender people either, and I think that it should, but again, um, this is the Berlin Memorial. Uh, if there was a way to talk about risk and complexity and intersectionality while still acknowledging this, this particular and horrific violence and injustice, um, that I think that that would be a good thing for us to work towards. Okay, thank you very much.